Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm actually going to be teaching at this law school starting in the fall, which uh, hasn't it, 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 it hasn't made me very popular at the northern terminus of Telegraph Avenue. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we have a, a terrific panel here, and we're going to be widening the lens of our discussion in this session in two ways. We're not just going to be taking a transnational perspective. We're also going to be thinking systemically. We had an interesting discussion this morning about how prosecutors in our system think and make decisions. And then we had a fascinating debate over lunch about whether, given the system that we have, um, good people should become prosecutors. We're now going to be focusing on what kind of a system we have um, and how it could be improved. Um, and the focus of our uh, discussion is going to be uh, a paper uh, by Professor Eric Luna, uh, who uh, uh, will summarize the paper for us. Um, Professor Luna is a 1996 graduate of this law school and currently the Sidney and Francis Lewis Professor of Law at Washington and Lee University, where he teaches and writes about uh, criminal law and criminal procedure. Before becoming a law professor, Professor Luna worked as an actual living, breathing prosecutor in the San Diego uh, District Attorney's Office. So he's written a paper called uh, Prosecutor King, which um, is not a defense of the status quo. Um, and uh, he's going to summarize it for us. But And then after he does that, we're going to have a discussion. And uh, the, I want to tell you about the other people on the panel so you can know what to look forward to while you're listening to Professor Luna. Um, the uh, rest of the panel, in addition to Professor Luna, will consist of um, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Simon, uh, who's sitting uh, to my right. He's the Adrian A. Cragen Professor of Law at UC Berkeley, where he teaches, writes, and blogs prolifically about criminal justice, law and culture, and socio-legal uh, studies. Um, at the end of the table is Professor Christopher Slobogan, who's the Milton R. Underwood Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University, where he's also a professor of psychiatry, and he directs Vanderbilt's uh, criminal justice program. Uh, Professor Slobogan taught here at this law school during the 2006-2007 academic year. And we're also joined um, uh, on screen uh, by uh, Maximo Langer, my former colleague uh, at uh, UCLA, um, where Professor Langer is professor of law. He's actually not there today. Today he's in Argentina, which is why he's joining us by Skype. Professor Langer teaches and writes about criminal law and criminal procedure with a particular focus on international and comparative criminal procedure. So as I said, we're going to start with uh, some remarks from Professor Luna. Then we're going to have a roundtable discussion. And then I hope to also take some questions from you. So as the discussion is proceeding, you should think about things that you'd like to ask or interject. So we'll start with Professor Luna. Thank you, David, very much. And thank you to Nick, Sarah, and uh, your colleagues on this wonderful endeavor. Uh, how exciting um, uh, to be starting up this journal, uh, and what a perfect place to be doing it at. Um, my paper, called Prosecutor King, draws upon, uh, uh, is kind of an homage to Plato. And it's been said that Western philosophy is characterized as a series of footnotes to Plato. Um, and for those, who, just to call upon your, your what you had in high school, your, uh, or maybe in an intro philosophy class in, in college. In The Republic, Plato imagined a utopian world where philosophers ruled as a result of their training, their knowledge, their yearning for truth, and their love of wisdom. Uh, the idea was that making political decisions requires skills and uh, a certain skills and judgment, and according to Plato, it should be left to the experts. Um, that would seem to be true with regards to most criminal justice systems today. Um, among the most important institutions uh, in any form of government is the criminal justice system. And in the United States, you might say that several different actors might vie for the throne of criminal justice system's platonic monarch. But as, as a matter of practical reality, um, the most powerful player is the American prosecutor. Um, in particular, the real world machinery uh, of criminal justice relies heavily on early fact finding by prosecutors and their de facto, if not de jure, uh, adjudication of most matters. Um, what has sometimes been called prosecutorial adjudication, a term that was coined by uh, Judge Jerry Lynch and was uh, brilliantly explicated by Maximo Longer, um, it's a functional rather than a formal conception of case resolution. The prosecutor decides on the, prosecutor, on the defendant's guilt, the amount of punishment he deserves, or both, which effectively determines the outcome of a case either because external uh, approval is not required um, or because it's granted as a matter of course. 
Uh, and this notion doesn't assume that the judgment is re reached based on any legal hearing or anything that might be called procedural justice. Uh, once you put aside the independent analysis and look at uh, the consequences, the adjudication by a prosecutor is no re less real than that of a judge. Uh, American prosecutors have the unreviewable power to decline cases. Their decisions simply can't be overturned by judges or other external entities. Under many determinate sentencing schemes, uh, prosecutors also have the power to set punishment upon conviction. Once a defendant is convicted of a crime carrying a mandatory minimum, uh, the prosecutor's opinion about punishment is final. The court, as a practical matter, as a matter of law today, does not uh, impose a lower sentence. In both cases, the prosecutorial adjudication is de jure. It's decisive. It's binding, uh, neither requiring the approval of the court, except its stamp of approval, um, uh, or uh, requiring anything else um, in, uh, for that outcome to occur. Now, they also have what we might call de jure prosecutorial uh, adjudication powers. Um, and it's best exemplified by plea bargaining. Uh, the defendant, of course, can decline a plea offer. Uh, the judge could, in theory, reject the agreement. But the vast majority of defendants take the deals. And the courts nearly, nearly always give the consent after perfunctory review. In these situations, the prosecutors are adjudicators in effect, requiring the formal agreement of others, but they almost always get their way. Now, most of my paper actually was, um, uh, you could say, uh, uh, summarized nicely. And so I won't go into detail. I'll let my colleagues talk about it by the last panel. Uh, when David Patton talked about um, the dictatorial powers of, of the prosecutor, or when the great Bob Gordon talked about the concentration of power. And that really is what's at issue here. I don't think prosecutors are bad people. I don't even think prosecutors, I think good people should be prosecutors for reasons that were stated. Um, it's just that they have too much damn power, and that's the issue. Um, and that beyond that, that they have certain incentive structures in this hyper-adversarial system that we have, in a system that is over-criminalized. Um, now, what I'd like to spend the bulk of my time today talking about um, is looking at prosecutorial power from a comparative perspective. Uh, that's, the, the, that's the second part of my paper. And this is not uh, uh, unusual. Legal commentators have discussed for a long time the, the, the areas of concurrence and disagreement between the Anglo-American common law um, systems, which have adopted a, an adversarial or accusatorial system, depending on how you describe it, um, and the civil law or continental law systems of Europe, which use inquisitorial methods of adjudication. Um, several distinguished academics have focused on the civil law tenet of strict uh, limited uh, prosecutorial discretion based on this so-called principle uh, of legality. You might call it the full enforcement conception of the rule of law. Um, and they've argued that, with a few minor exceptions, mandatory or compulsory prosecution was the rule in a continental system, uh, and in their inquisitorial style of adjudication, that American-style plea bargaining was verboten. Um, mandatory prosecution, at least, was argued to provide a means to tame prosecutorial discretion in the United States. It could guarantee certain aspects of equal protection, perhaps, uh, to suspects and defendants, and a rule of law like restriction on arbitrary decision making. The curious aspect about this is that American scholars seem to have greater interest in their foreign colleagues than the Europeans. By and large, European scholars presume that prosecutors abided by the legality principle. They were seen as rather dull bureaucrats. They inspected files. They sifted out those cases with insufficient evidence, as the principle of legality requires, only to pass on along any meaningful decision making to judges. As it turns out, that's just not true. Um, European prosecutors, at least at a surface level, have a lot of uh, in common with American with their American uh, counterparts, at least with regards to the extent that they exercise de facto or de jure um, uh, authority to adjudicate uh, cases. Now, this conclusion is based on research over the past dozen or so years, results from uh, the first uh, uh, the compilation and publication of criminal justice statistics um, uh, from European nations, a long-term process after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the attempt for a unified uh, Europe. But what it demonstrated is that, as in the United States, trials in Europe are the exception. And alternative processes and case declinations are, in fact, the rule. And the range of options that are available to European prosecutors does bear some, at least, facial resemblance to the powers of American prosecutors. They both 
uh, decline or drop substantial number of cases, either for evidentiary reasons or, or on public policy grounds. Um, they, the notion of a conditional disposal appears roughly comparable to uh, American diversionary schemes, terminating cases without imposing convictions, provided that the defendants fulfill certain obligations. Um, something called a penal order um, is rather exceptional, um, but proceedings in low-level uh, American courts uh, and misdemeanor courts become so standardized with specific crimes correlated with an accepted going rate, as they sometimes say, um, that the plea agreements uh, reached may basically effectively um, equate to a penal order. Um, they also, pro European prosecutors also have the power to engage in what, what's sometimes called negotiated settlements um, that sometimes could be analogized to uh, American plea bargains. There are some critical differences, and that will matter later, um, as I'll say, but um, they are at least enough in common between the American plea bargain and European negotiated settlements as to treat them as members of the same species. Um, for those uh, uh, regulations that, uh, those resolutions that require court approval, prosecutors virtually lead the judicial hand in signing the orders. And it's at this point that my colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic uh, have become quite nervous, and they speak of a convergence between the American criminal justice system and the European criminal justice system. Um, in exercising their case disposal and sanctioning powers, prosecutors are essentially deciding uh, that a given suspect is responsible for a crime. Uh, and likely to be convicted at trial, but they bypass the conventional process and adjudicate it based on uh, the available information. And sometimes this, is, this power is de facto adjudication where a negotiated case settlement requires agreement by the defendant and approval by the judge, but it's uh, rarely withheld, at least on the judicial end, meaning that the prosecutor's discretionary decision is essentially adjudicate the case. Um, there are many forms of prosecutorial adjudication on both sides of, of the uh, Atlantic um, that are being pushed by caseload pressures. And some of those include um, what you might see as de jure adjudication. When a case is dropped on public interest grounds, it can't be revived by the courts by and large, or when um, a Dutch or a Swedish prosecutor uses their respective penal order procedures that do not even require the signature of a court. Um, prosecutors across Europe, they face amazing caseloads, a lot like our American colleagues, sometimes as many as 1,000 cases per year. Um, and in order to, uh, to deal with these, uh, these heavy dockets, they've come up with mechanisms short of the conventional trial, and they frequently dispose of most of the cases that come across their desk without a trial. And even when they go uh, to trial, this cliched image of uh, passive prosecution in, con in the Continental Trial no longer exists. When I talk to my friends in Germany, they talk about how the old story was that a prosecutor would, would be able to read a novel while the trial would get up, only to place it down and give a summary at the very end. The truth is that that's no longer true. The, the European prosecutor exerts heavily in, heavy influence on the court's decision making through the documents that are assembled in this thing called a dossier. You've probably all heard it, at least on television. Um, and the prosecution's presentation of evidence and cross examinative witnesses this is, they provide um, a, a, a framework for any type of resolution. Um, prosecutorial discretion, the answer is it exists everywhere. And it looks a lot like adjudication, and maybe even lawmaking. And this has raised some important issues for the European scholars. They would prefer that their system not look like the American system. Um, it's a challenge to the principle of legality and the mandatory prosecution doctrine in those civil law nations that still abide by that. Um, and it raises serious concerns about the sidelining or even the elimination of courts uh, in the criminal process. But I always have to tell them to, to the, calm down a little bit and recognize that whatever they are facing, it, it does not quite compare um, to the, the, uh, the power that is exerted by prosecutors on this side. And whatever trends of convergence might exist, um, they probably are not uh, based on some intentional uh, uh, synthesis of principles um, or accord on some fundamental uh, principles. Instead, you have this shallow convergence, and that convergence is just based on the power of the prosecutors to adjudicate cases, and the similarity is probably uh, based solely on the need to adjudicate so many cases. That doesn't mean you can't draw lessons, and if you've read, for example, Professor Longer's work, you, you can draw some really terrific lessons. And the most important lessons, at least to me, are those that um, stem not from the similarities but from the differences. The primary area of divergence between uh, the United States and um, countries on the other side of the Atlantic 
um, has a lot to do with the content and the structure of the law. In Europe, the effect of prosecutorial adjudication by the maintenance of, of relatively narrow penal codes and mild, sentence, and, uh, mild sentencing schemes prevents the type of abuses or are concerns that are raised on this side. Um, the European criminal provisions have remained relatively stable over the years. The concepts like vicarious liability and guilt without culpable mental states are generally rejected. And imprisonment is used only as the ultima ratio, the last resort. You see that across Europe, at least in Western Europe. Um, the most disturbing manifestations of overcriminalization, especially the sheer breadth of the penal codes, is lar largely unheard of in the European systems. Um, in terms of comparative sentencing analysis, Europe is far less likely to incarcerate individuals than in the United States. Uh, a number of reasons have been offered for the punitive gap between the United States and Europe, but for present purposes, the most important thing uh, is that criminal justice issues are less influenced by raw politics uh, in Europe. Uh, legal experts, practitioners help shape continental European policy, opting for more progressive approaches such as decriminalization and, diver and uh, diversion, rather than following some uh, puni uh, punitive populism, as the phrase has been used. And European prosecutors, uh, which seems odd from this side, were among those criminal justice professionals who have tried to maintain the status quo and have fought against uh, uh, the kind of hyper uh, inflation of the criminal justice system. Um, their interests and their allegiances lie with the profession. They're invested with in maintaining the system as it currently exists. Um, even though there are important changes that are occurring in Europe, there is a great deal of a reluctance to adopt practices that would undermine the legitimacy of that criminal justice system. And despite an increase in negotiated settlements, like I said, they look something at least vaguely like a plea bargaining, um, there are some real differences and by and large, uh, professionals and scholars on the other side of the Atlantic are aghast at plea bargaining pra uh, practices here in the United States. And this brings me to an important point. There appears to be a general consensus abroad that the use of coercive plea bargaining through expanded criminal liability and threats of harsh punishment are simply beyond the pale. Um, there is no indication that European prosecutors threaten harsher consequences to facilitate agreements or to invoke um, uh, them when the bargains fail. Plea bargaining in, in, again, very different across the countries, but some, some, some core similarities tend to be for misdemeanors, less serious felonies. Bargaining over charges may be barred or it may be stringently limited. Sentencing discounts may be limited to a fraction of the sentence. So, for example, in England and Wales and Italy, if you strike a bargain, it is a third off on the sentence. And that's that. Um, some of the constraints in the European prosecutors come from internal guidelines which are considered important means of ensuring accountability and a degree of uniformity in decision making. Guidelines might be issued for any number of decisions throughout the criminal process, although the most important ones I would suspect are those that deal with case endings. Um, I, from the various countries, the, the country that gives the fullest expression of guidelines as a form of law is probably the Dutch, the Dutch system. Um, Dutch prosecutors who, although not as powerful because of the, uh, the more mild system they, uh, they exist in, they are, in a very real sense, the most powerful prosecutors in the world. Um, they, any type of constraints that they place on, uh, uh, that exist uh, with regards to Dutch prosecutors, they've placed on themselves, which is, uh, seems otherworldly from this side of the Atlantic. Um, Dutch prosecutors are constrained by the Minister, Ministry of Justice's uh, criminal law policies. They're formulated in consultation with the body of senior prosecutors. This so-called College of Prosecutors General, they implement the policy choices by issuing guidelines on various choices. Um, a power to waive a prosecution is channeled by a lengthy instruction on the rationales for non-prosecution. I think there's a handout that, that was given. On the back of it, you'll see um, this, uh, what an example of the Polaris guideline system for sentencing. Sentencing recommendations are driven by this highly detailed computerized point system that sets both the uh, potential case ending and the type of punishment. So if a, 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 a suspect uh, uh, amasses a certain amount of points, the case must be brought to court, or if it falls within certain boundaries, the prosecutor must use a conditional disposal. Um, and in fact, Dutch suspects can insist upon a conditional disposal when their point score entitles them to that resolution. Any deviation from these rules requires a Dutch prosecutor to give a detailed written reasoning for his decision, and that will usually be reviewed by the superiors. More generally, the use and effect of prosecutorial adjudication 
uh, varies based on the culture in which it takes place, and in Europe, at least continental Europe, that has a great effect. Um, the European prosecutor is not an American district attorney who simply speaks another language. Um, what distinguishes prosecutors across the Atlantic is not necessarily their adjudicative functions. I think they're very similar in some sense, but it's the mindsets and structures in which they operate. The discretion of European prosecutors, particularly those in civil law nations, is constrained by various soft factors that tend to reduce the potential for abuse. Uh, the continental tradition displays a, a particular proclivity for nonpartisan uh, public service. They're charged with complete objectivity in the pursuit of truth based on a foundational belief in the existence of what they call material truth, that it can be determined by dispassionate fact-finding, which in turn reflects the inquisitorial tradition. Uh, under, view, under this view, law as a science is the product of a rational design um, uh, and a rational decision-making that can be established through this process. Now, that doesn't mean that, in fact, this occurs. I think legal realism has destroyed the notion of uh, formalism or mechanical decision making. But what matters is that you, the European prosecutors and their mindsets, they actually believe in it. They believe that their responsibility is to find out the objective truth. Um, and this affects their, their worldview, uh, the functions, the appropriate practices within a criminal justice system. And that scientific conception is core to the education and professional training of prosecutors who become career servants. They're often associated with the judicial function some of them are, in fact, judges, uh, some kind called the standing judiciary. Um, the concerns about separation of powers are a little bit different in Europe. Um, in fact, European prosecutors and judges, they're trained together, they participate in the same professional groups and programs, and their shared experiences in even a judicial status underscores the expectation of a more objective functioning and discovering the truth and reacting appropriately to it. Now, how far they actually live up to this, that's uh, an open question. But the fundamental setting strongly affects the way in which European prosecutors perceive their role and their work. New prosecutors are on a dedicated career path. They'll usually remain prosecutors for the rest of their life. They become members of a professional civil service, uh, and they're surrounded by experienced attorneys who see themselves as long-term inhabitants of a working culture that emphasizes professional ethics. They, they work within a hierarchical institutional structures where they have to follow the written guidelines. They have regular reviews and other bureaucratic controls um, on their discretion. They're expected to abide by those guidelines, and if they don't, they're, they're, they are, uh, may well be disciplined for it, um, and they may well be removed from cases. And it's these things, the legal culture, the education, the training, the hierarchy, the bureaucratic controls, these are the things that limit the potential for the most abusive aspects of prosecutorial adjudication, along with, of course, a far milder criminal justice system. Now, with that said, um, I don't mean to glorify European prosecutors. It would be naive to assume that they always get it right. They don't. Um, European prosecutors are not free from pressures of high caseloads, sca scarce resources, and limited time. The bureaucratic hierarchical approach can be tedious, and it can be effective. And European civil service and its security of tenure can breed a degree of complacency. Um, other protections may undermine transparency and accountability. And the pressure to close files hardly seems like some kind of transcendental component of justice. And the near automation of prosecutorial work in some nations is demonstrated by uh, the Dutch Polaris uh, sentencing system. Pro provides a jurisprudence so mechanical that one could easily lose sight that you are sentencing a human being. And whatever you have to say about these two systems, both the American and European prosecutors stand as kings of their respectable, uh, respective criminal justice system. And like Learned Hand, um, I find it, to use the quote from his, his great book, The Bill of Rights, most irksome to be ruled by a bevy of platonic guardians, even if I knew how to choose them, which I assuredly do not. Uh, but if I have to pick, I'll take <coughs> the prosecutor king whose dominion is most narrow and whose mindset is most platonic. Again, thank you for, for coming here and for listening to this, and I'm quite excited to hear what my colleagues have to say. So, um, thanks, Eric. So, um, this is a, an incredibly interesting and provocative paper. Um, I, I'm going to sketch out a question that it raises for me, and then I, I guess I'm interested in what uh, Jonathan and Chris and Maximo all have to say to the, uh, about this. So, the title, Prosecutor King, uh, and the analogies to 
Plato's philosopher kings, suggests that you're characterizing the American prosecutor as a kind of elitist meritocrat uh, who has too much discretionary authority. And a lot of the argument you've given is, is about how pro we've given prosecutors, individual prosecutors, too much power. Um, and uh, some of what David Patton said in the, la over the, in the lunch debate w was along the same lines, that prosecutors are kind of like dictators. But a lot of the thrusts of the lunch debate seem to me to be different. And in fact, a lot of the thrusts of David Patton's comments seem to be different. It seems to be that individual prosecutors don't really have that much wiggle room, that the system drives them in a particular way, and that if you think you're going to be able to reform the system by being a prosecutor, you're kidding yourself. Because the system has a logic um, of which you become a servant. That suggests that uh, the problem isn't the power of individual prosecutors. The power is the, pro the, the, the problem is the power of a machinery. Uh, and that the problem is that that machinery is overpowers not only defense attorneys, but the prosecutors who otherwise could try to reform from within. Um, so that's one puzzle that I'm left with. The other thing is, though, that a lot of your comments, Eric, suggested that the problem isn't really uh, the power of individual prosecutors, and it's not even the power of the machinery, it's the culture uh, of uh, American prosecutors. And not only that, but what I heard you suggest was that the, the, the way, the, the particular deficiency, or one big part of the deficiency in the culture of American prosecutors, is not that there are too meritocratic and too elitist, but precisely that they're too democratically responsive. And that's what's wonderful about European prosecutors is that they take seriously uh, their duties as elitist meritocrats. So the, I guess the question is, what, what is the problem that we should be attacking here uh, systemically? Is it the power of individual prosecutors? Is it the power of the machinery? Or is it the power of uh, the professional culture uh, in which prosecutors operate, or is it some combination? And um, maybe, Jonathan, if I could ask you to take a first stab sure. at that. Let me, um, first of all, I, say I really appreciate uh, Eric's paper, and I think it's going to yeah. do great service in bringing a lot of what we know and don't know about this complicated issue into a place in a discussion. I also really agree with you that we ought to be looking at every aspect of the American criminal justice system right now through the lens of mass imprisonment, how it contributed to that, how we get out of mass imprisonment what will have to change. I also agree with you that we can learn a lot from Europe and Latin America, where lower levels of punishment seem to go along with different prosecutorial styles, but also other as different aspects of the system. And indeed, that mindset and structures, uh, the soft features of organizational life are very important. I agree with all of that. What I want to, uh, where I'm a little skeptical and where I think uh, the American problem is, in a sense, uh, unsolvable, uh, either by becoming more elite or, or more populist, uh, really has to do with the nature of the American state. And I guess to go back to, uh, to Jim Whitman's work for a moment, who you invoke but who's obviously not here, uh, it, our problem, in a nutshell, uh, is lack of, of dignity as a powerful constitutional or legal value. And that, in a nutshell, if you want to do something about mass imprisonment and about changing American criminal justice, I would say forget about prosecutors, enhance dignity as a legal value in our system, and other things will fall into place. My concern about, uh, so the other question to ask that sort of gets to the elite uh, populist point is why hasn't the legality principle, which Europeans and others have thought of as a main force driving reform and sort of restraint in the criminal process, helped in America? And I think the problem is legality is tied to the growth of the state as a, a strong, progressive, reforming institution. And in a sense, in America, we've never had a modern state, in a sense. So our, while prosecutors operate as elites, that is, they enjoin with other important apparatuses of state control, as Nikki Lacey has shown in her work, the American state is so fragmented that it cannot form, even in its elites, kind of a, a structure like a European state that views itself as responsible for the population and sort of is inclined to sort of view itself as having a, a what used to be thought of as an aristocratic duty to sort of govern in the name of this population. Instead, they tend to either conflate their private interests with the public interest or define the private interests, the public interest so narrowly uh, that it can't really do much good. On the other side, the populist side, here I think we're really haunted by the ghost of our common law heritage and the system of private prosecution. Because even though our uh, uh, colonists very quickly develop public prosecution services, in some ways we've never stopped thinking about our prosecutors as private prosecutors. They represent the victim. They don't represent the state in this European sense and its larger interests in the community. And this is 
powerful because all that power, all that dictatorial power, ends up uh, often getting portrayed in the frailty of the victim. And it's, it may just be a larger feature of the way in which sort of the white republic of America has, oh, white citizens have always viewed government action that benefits them as not public action, right? So when the government builds a freeway to our suburb so that we can drive downtown, that's not public action. But when they give money to inner city uh, people, that is public action. And, and prosecution is one version of that. The fact that it's a public prosecutor has not stopped white citizens from imagining it as essentially a branch of their own private sense of victimization. And that's why I think uh, populism doesn't help much, because the electoral mass in America are suburban homeowner voters, at least in most prosecutorial districts. So in that sense, that, that populist uh, energy will not uh, lead to reform. So again, uh, uh, important uh, features that are different. Uh, I think if we did some of these changes in American prosecution, it might improve some things, but it wouldn't fundamentally alter the punitiveness of a system that has never really evolved into the kind of uh, reform legality principle that you might have in Europe and in Latin America. So. Right, in a minute, I want to turn to uh, Chris and Maximo. But first, I want to say I, I'm very excited about joining the faculty here. I really, really am. But I hope you'll understand now why there are moments when I think, what kind of a moron gives up having Jonathan Simon as a colleague? <laughs> <laughs> Please just have yeah, the fight. Uh, so uh, Chris, um, Jonathan suggested that the real problem here is, isn't prosecutors so much as, as the overall legal culture. And I'm wondering if you think that's right, or if you think that there are lessons uh, that we can draw about how to attack um, the problem of prosecutorial power. Well, you're just praising the high heaven, so I have to say it's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think certainly part of the issue is cultural, but I'll, I'll focus on a different part yeah. of American legal, culture, uh, American legal culture. I think our society is individualism on steroids. And I think um, one of the problems we have is a plea bargaining system, which leaves not only the guilt innocence issue, but the sentencing disposition entirely up to the parties. I mean, Eric points this out in the case. It's really incredible when you think about it. The judge has virtually no role to play in 95% of the cases in this country. It's the attorneys getting together and negotiating who's guilty and who's innocent and what kind of sentence that individual's going to get. And I think that stems from our culture of individualism. It's the adversarial system that instantiates this um, individualist culture. Um, and again, I think Eric's done a very good job of being uh, careful about glorifying the European system. But it is the case, as Eric points out in his paper, that the bottom line adjudicator in Europe is still the judge, not the parties, despite all the power the prosecutors have, um, at least in serious cases. And Maxim, I think, can back this up, or he'll maybe add some nuances to this. I hope I'm right about this. Um, that cases have to go to the judge. The judge has to investigate cases. Cases cannot be truncated by a guilty plea. At least serious cases cannot be. Um, there is no such thing as a guilty plea. There is plea bargaining, but there's no such thing as a guilty plea. Cases have to go to trial. Judges have to adjudicate whether a person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And they also have to find facts <coughs> that support whatever sentence is being imposed. That's a very different culture, a very different system than we have here, where because of our individualistic bent, we've basically handed over the criminal justice system to prosecutors. And I think if we moved in the European direction, we'd reduce prosecutors from being kings to mere princes, which I think would be a very nice move. I have a lot of other things to say, but I think I'll stop there because I'm probably stepping on Maximo's toes, and he probably can add to a lot of, uh, to what I just said about procedural differences between the two systems. Maximo, is, is Chris right? Are you there, Maximo? Uh oh. Oh no. Oh, he's saying I'm right, in case you can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ad for Skype, I guess. Maximo, can you hear us now? I can hear you. I can hear you. It got interrupted for a sec. Sorry about that. Uh, did you hear what Chris said? Uh, I, I heard until almost the very end, but not the very, very end. So he says that in, maybe in, in yeah. Europe, um, uh, prosecutors really are just princes, not kings, because the judge exerts um, uh, more of a check on prosecutorial power. And I, I think I heard you right, Chris, to suggest that America would do well to move in that direction. Do you agree with that, Maximo? OK. So uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to the, and congratulations to the organizers uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the event. You know, and, and congratulations also for, the, for launching this uh, Stanford Journal on Criminal Law and, and Policy. The, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's such a treat, I mean, like, to, to share this panel with you know, all these friends and very distinguished uh, uh, colleagues. Um, so 
let me say a couple of things. First, I think that the work that Derek has been doing, not only in this paper, but more broadly, you know, in this, this line of research, right, on, on comparative prosecution and comparative prosecutorial adjudication uh, is very important. And it's very important um, because, you know, it renews in a number of ways uh, our, um, our perspectives uh, on uh, these issues that in, in some way they are very old, but uh, in other ways they are new, you know, some of these uh, 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 developments and, and it really brings a, a new perspective on that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's important work and, and, and I am very, very uh, glad that, that, uh, that Eric keeps, you know, pursuing this, this line of, of research. Um, why, and, and why I think it's very important? Well, one of the reasons is because Eric is right uh, that uh, prosecutors have become more and more important, uh, not only uh, in the US, but uh, around the world. Uh, I think that it's a European phenomenon, but it's broader even than a European phenomenon. I, it's a Latin American phenomenon, and, and it's a phenomenon that you find uh, in other places uh, in the world. Uh, the part that I think uh, um, um, Chris uh, is right about, you know, within, you know, trying to 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 check, to see whether you know they have. Okay, just because you say what I was right. <laughs> well, um, Sarah, is there? Wait, where's Sarah? Um, well, I don't. Do one of you tech savvy young people want to try? Gone now. Um, the video. Well, while we're waiting, while we're. No, I was saying that in, in, in most European systems, at least for the most uh, Western European systems, at least for the most serious cases, you know, the, the old system is still, is still applies, right? That's true. But again, that doesn't deny anything of what Eric is saying regarding the increasing importance of prosecutors in European systems and in other systems of the world, in the world, and also on the fact that given that increasing role and increasing powers of prosecutors, this phenomenon of prosecutorial adjudication is not only a European, a, a, an American phenomenon, but it's rather a phenomenon that we find uh, in other places in the world, and we need to conceptualize and think about it and compare, because from the comparison, you know, we may understand better our system, and, and it may help us think better about our system. Whether, what brings, what brings this, you know, going back to David's initial question, is it, you know, individual prosecutors, the machinery, or, or culture, well, you know, I would say the machinery and culture, right? I mean, you know, then, but, but the problem with the machinery and culture in the case of the U.S. is that perhaps uh, it gives too much power to uh, individuals that, of course, are good people, you know, for the most part, as most of us are, uh, and, and of course are well intended, uh, but they actually have a, per, a, a, a perverse, a perverse incentives, right, not to do justice in the individual case, or they come from too adversarial of a culture or too a negotiating type of culture, as Chris was suggesting, or, or things, or things, a, 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 things a, a like that. Um, it's, it's in that sense that I think the, the, the European phenomenon, at, at least, well, in, 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 in that sense that it's, it's different, I mean, or, or in this, in this very analysis indicates the directions in which the European phenomenon is different. I mean, first, they are less, you know, they are, what is at the stake in, a, in an average European criminal case is less serious than what it is in an average American case. And in the case of prosecutorial adjudication, the fact of prosecutorial adjudication, it's even uh, more true that that's, you know, that European prosecutors are dealing with less serious matters because, again, the most serious cases are still uh, in most systems in the hands of the usual proceedings. Uh, second, uh, prosecutors, in fact, come from different culture in all sorts of ways, educational backgrounds, you know, training, 
uh, institutional, uh, uh, you know, institutional position of the of office of the prosecutor, you know, within the judiciary sometimes, or as pseudo judiciary officials, less adversarial culture, you know, less if they are not elected in, in most cases, except for you know a few places in, in Switzerland. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, as, as Jonathan Simon has written on on, on his on his uh, on his uh, uh, work, you know, uh, fear of crime, right, has been less uh, important of an issue. And then I think the third point that uh, Chris explores less in his in his uh, paper uh, and in his talk is that there are also important procedural issues um, because uh, uh, typically when when, pros when American prosecutors are de facto adjudicating cases, there is very little except you know leaving aside you know some the Southern District uh, office of New York or some very sophisticated office. There is very little that has happened uh, in terms of interactions between uh, the defense and the prosecution office. Uh, 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 and what I mean by this is that if the prosecutor is adjudicating the case, the defense should have a, a, a true opportunity to you know, argue its case and present the evidence and ask for the evidence that the, the, that, that the uh, adjudicator is considering, all this stuff. And none of this uh, is happening in most cases uh, um, in, uh, in American uh, plea, plea bargains. And for, for some procedural reasons that I, I cannot explain in detail now, they do happen more often, I think, at least in a number of European systems uh, with differences that we should also uh, elaborate uh, on. So, Eric, um if I'm right that there were uh, two different strands to your argument, one uh, criticizing prosecutors for being too el elitist and anti-democratic, and the other one wishing that prosecutors were more insulated from democracy, I hear uh, uh, Chris and Maximo to be saying that they agree with a lot of your argument. And the part of the argument that they agree with is the part that says, Prosecutors should be less democratic, less democratically accountable. So we should shift power away from prosecutors to judges, like the Europeans do, and let judges keep prosecutors in check. And prosecutors should develop a more professional culture, um, uh, so they're less swept up in anti-crime hysteria. So what nobody is talking about is beefing up grand juries or empowering electorates uh, to exercise control over prosecutors and make prosecutorial more, elections more meaningful. And um, the beginning of your paper suggests that you have some, part of your concern is that prosecutors are too removed from popular opinion. And you'd like to bring the criminal justice system, um, um, you'd like to allow the public to have more connection to or control over the criminal justice system. And I'm wondering, um, do you want to continue to defend that? And if so, um, do you do you see a, do you are you comfortable with suggesting that the, what we should be doing to bring prosecutorial power uh, to tame prosecutorial power all has to do with moving power to less democratically ele uh, accountable officials or making prosecutors themselves um, uh, more less populous in some way? Good, good questions. And uh, I, I should begin by. One way in which to frame my paper is, and my, my thought processes, is although there is no, some normative argument in it, um, I am not trying to say that we should adopt, necessarily adopt the European system. I think that there is there's a, a school of, of comparative law that believes in um, uh, what they call the better solutions approach, that you can, there are better solutions and we just ne simply need to adopt them. And I, I'm not so sure that that's even possible. I think. The, the, the idea of airlifting in um, a system from Europe and dropping it in the United States, even the British system, uh, uh, probably asked too much for the reasons that have been discussed and also because of, uh, among other works, Jonathan's brilliant work uh, governing uh, through crime. We, we are a, and, and uh, Whitman's work and Nikki Lacey's work, describing these, under, these, uh, uh, these forces underlying the criminalization of society um, that seem to be um, uh, uh, the populism in a kind of the uh, the iron triangle of, of uh, elected officials, 
uh, of their constituents and the media, that everything goes in one direction. Um, I don't know that you can solve it simply by airlifting things in. What I do think comparative serves us is it's, it's a mirror. Um, that the old saying is that a, a man who knows only one country, knows his own country, knows no country. And by looking at the way that the Europeans have approach uh, the prosecutorial function, and the fact that they're aghast at their own system or the changes, um, it says a little bit about our own system and the problems that we have. I think, it, as, as, um, as Maximo said, I think it is both the machinery and the culture. Um, uh, what can you do about it? Uh, what are the choices that can be made? Well, uh, it's, we are constrained by a national constitution. There are limitations. So if you wanted, for example, if you wanted to have um, uh, Al, Al Schuler many, many years ago talked about what we need to do to get rid of plea bargaining is to have lots of trials, but really short trials. Uh, I don't know how you achieve that in the current system in a particularly, for example, post Crawford, you're never going to have a dossier that you can just simply uh, put before judges the way that they do in the Netherlands. If you want to have lots of trials, you need to have a system that allows for you to be able to deal with the most serious crimes in the course of an afternoon. And you can't do that in the United States under the current, uh, uh, current system. Um, if, I wanted to, if, you, if I wanted to provide some solutions to this, the solutions clearly have to do with the expanse of the criminal justice system and the punitiveness of, of our, our sentencing regime. Uh, it's not just that prosecutors have skewed incentives. That's, the pro that's certainly the problem. But even if you had uh, uh, a kind of adversarial tyrant, if they were in a mild system, they would just be a petty tyrant. The problem is that we, they are in a system uh, way where they get to make life uh, and sometimes death decisions on a daily basis. Um, so I, I, to the extent that this has serves a function towards uh, uh, reform, I would hope that it would, again, maybe serve as a mirror to those who are looking at the prosecutorial uh, system that we have in the United States, and whether or not, um, as uh, Bob Gordon said, whether this is really a problem of, of separation of powers uh, uh, that simply has been allowed to propagate as, the, uh, as our judiciary has largely let substantive criminal law um, uh, go uh, its own way. Kristen, do you want to talk about Yeah, uh, this is a panel on comparative law, so I'm in favor of airlifting. <laughs> um, at least for, for right now. Um, I sort of like Al Schuller's idea. That's what I was pushing toward earlier, but uh, you have to take Eric's point because that would really upend the system in terms of efficiency. Maximo's made a very interesting suggestion, which is building on the European approach, that at least judges ought to be able to require prosecutors to sign a document under oath that they believe they have proof beyond reasonable doubt, the defendant's guilty, and describing the evidence that proves that. And there also be an also ought to be an obligation on the part of the judge to find the facts relevant to sentences. At least we could go that far. Yeah. That's a more inquisitorial, more European approach. And I think it would undermine, to some extent, prosecutorial power. And then I also took this panel as, as an invitation to think really outside the box. And one other possibility, which granted would be harder to institute, but nonetheless could be <laughs> said, said to be borrowed from some foreign uh, cultures, is indeterminate sentencing. Remember indeterminate sentencing yeah. from way back when? Um, where they're basically the sentencing decision is, is based on individual prevention factors like risk and treatability. Um, if we went to that kind of system, I think it would seriously undermine prosecutorial power, uh, probably in a good way. Uh, George Fisher, who we had talking to the panel this morning, uh, did a very interesting study of the history of plea bargaining that was alluded to this morning. And one of the findings he made was it was the rise of plea bargaining during the 20th century that led to the demise of indeterminate sentencing. And it's pretty obvious why, right? In indeterminate sentencing, who makes the sentencing decision? The back end decision maker, the parole board, the expert panel, not the judge, not the prosecutor. The decision made at the back end as opposed to the front end. So the defendant can't be given uh, a plea offer because the, the defendant can't be guaranteed any particular sentence. So no rational defendant is going to take the plea. Um, and as a result, what happened, according to George Fisher, is that prosecutors and judges resorted to various ruses to make sentencing more determinate. And finally and eventually the, the legislature signed on and now we have determined sentencing in this country, which I think is a very interesting historical take on the, the evolution of our sentencing practices. Well, I'm asking for the reverse dynamic. Let's go back to indeterminate sentencing. If we instituted indeterminate sentencing, it would seriously undermine prosecutorial plea bargaining power. Now, of course, the response to that is, well, plea bargaining would basically end and the whole system would collapse because of our caseload problems. Um, well, indulge me for a second. I'm not sure that would be the case. For instance, I'm envisioning something like the old model penal code. Remember the old model penal code? 
Um, it's gone now. The, the American Law Institute decided to get rid of the sentencing provisions of the Model Penal Code, which is really unfortunate in my opinion. Under the old Model Penal Code, you had broad sentencing ranges, one to five years, one to 10 years, one to 20 years for third, second, and first degree felonies. Um, in that kind of system, a prosecutor still would have control over charging, at least in some kinds of cases, could guarantee a defendant a lower maximum sentence in some kinds of cases. But more importantly, prosecutors would still have the authority, like they did under the old indeterminate sentencing regimes, of offering defendants uh, diversion into the community uh, on the condition that the defendant completed whatever program is involved, the substance abuse treatment program, vocational training program, whatever, whatever it is. In other words, prosecutors can still offer probation in lieu of prison time. And I think that's a very powerful incentive for defendants to plead guilty, and, or not plead guilty, excuse me, if I go through my inquisitorial approach to go to court for that quick and dirty trial that we talked about earlier in bargain cases. In any event, I think that would be a system that could work. Um, one last point and then I'm gonna stop. Um, in that kind of system, I think still prosecutors would, um, well, let's put it this way, prosecutors would not be willing to reduce charges or to divert uh, offenders charged or people charged with first degree felonies. That's pretty clear, homicide, rape, armed robbery, neither of the two options I just described would work. But I, I guess I don't have a problem with those cases going to trial. Those are the most, most dangerous people, the most culpable people. We ought to be trying those people. And it would not lead to collapse of the system, um, I don't think, because according to the internet, which is my main source for this information, uh, in this country, we only charge roughly 80,000 felonies of any type per year. 80,000 felonies of any type per year. If we took every single one of those felonies to trial, we still be conducting less than half the trials, criminal trials we actually do conduct in this country, about 170,000 uh, bench and jury trials. So it's worth considering that as a possibility, again, thinking outside the box. So, you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to many of the virtues of the indeterminate sentence. It's interesting that having just reminded us how deeply libertarian and individualistic American culture is, you're not proposing embracing a very European, very preventative, right. very regulatory administrative sort of I'm approach. Really approach. So I mean, I, I'm sympathetic, but again, we're going to fight the same cultural, uh, we're going to fight uphill against the same cultural force. The other problem, of course, is let me introduce you to the new members of a California's brand new adult authority. Here's the former head of the uh, guards union. Uh, here's the former district attorney of San Bernardino County. Here's the former. So that, uh, that kind of parole board would be a not terribly uh, powerful vehicle getting people out of prison, I suspect. But what I wanted to bring back into the conversation, see what Eric might say about it, is, 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 is another of the great scholars cited here that we haven't talked about yet, and that's William Stuntz, and the idea of the dynamic that has been created in America between prosecutors and legislators that has produced this, you know, this incredibly powerful arsenal. And the problem I would pose to you is once that arsenal is in place, does it really matter whether you have the Crown Prosecution Service or the Dutch? Or the Americans. So, you know, the Americans, after all, we had this weird, awkward common law system for a century and a half or so before mass incarceration, and it didn't create mass incarceration. So it doesn't always uh, uh, do that. Something else has to, uh, to enact it. And one of the things is if you look at the American system of the 19th century, it's sort of like a flintlock rifle. You get kind of one shot, and it's not very accurate, and it's not very hard to hurt anybody with the bullet. Uh, now uh, the prosecutor's got something like an Uzi, and it's really hard to pull the trigger without cleaning out the street, basically. Uh, it's, it's very hard to apply these uh, sort of professional normative-based uh, restraints in a system that has just that much raw power, to go back to the power point for a moment. Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. I, 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 the, the incentive structures do, uh, do cause problems. The notion that an individual, uh, which hasn't been, the, the empirical support, seem, there seems to be some, a lot of theoretical work about wh what do prosecutors maximize? And the, at least the conventional wisdom is they maximize the number of convictions. Sometimes they maximize the uh, cumulative amount of sentences, uh, uh, the total sentences they obtain. Uh, I've had discussions, uh, the dean of prosecutorial studies, Ron Wright, I've had discussions about that. He has some doubts about that, at least in, in, the, in the, the worst cases. Uh, but I can definitely say with regards to the Europeans that their, their concerns are not, uh, uh, are not about amassing a uh, putting a, a series of scalps on their wall. Uh, what, if, again, if they're, what is driving the movement towards prosecutorial adjudication is to move the stuff off their desks. There's just too many cases. Oh, is that true in the United States? Sure, it's, it's most definitely true in misdemeanor courts. It, 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 when, when your colleague Feely talked about the, the processes, the punishment, talked about the way in which 
adjudication occurs in misdemeanor courts. I'm not so sure things have changed much. And I think New Haven, you could generalize to lots of places. Um, so, uh, but with that said, if you took a Dutch prosecutor or you took a German prosecutor, the German prosecutor being, quote unquote, the most objective uh, 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 professional in the world, they used to d describe it, they would still be an incredibly dangerous individual if there were, if they could use 18 USC 923C. I mean, they could throw somebody away for 25 years. And that, and so it's the combination of those things. And, uh, and I could go back, I don't know how to solve the problem, the, the legislative problem with over criminalization and the movement towards more punishment. Uh, nobody's come up with a really good solution. Although things seem to align in interesting ways, you start seeing folks, both the ACLU and the Heritage Foundation and my own Cato Institute, all agreeing that over criminalization is a problem. I'd like to think that that it bodes for a good future in terms of the criminalization problem. Uh, but what certainly uh, 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 is of, 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 of great concern um, is that the courts have, have basically thrown up their hands with regards to questions about charging, with regards to plea bargains, with regards to, I mean, they, don't, they just simply don't question the charges as long as there's some factual, it's supposed to be, it, is, there a, is there a probable cause uh, for that initial bite and is there a proof beyond a reasonable doubt if it actually goes to trial? And uh, how many, how many uh, substantive crimes have they struck down? If you put aside reproductive freedom, if you put aside freedom of expression, uh, it's in the past 30 years, Morales. It's one, one single uh, statute. Uh, and if you look at um, uh, sentences that have been struck down over the past 30 years, it was one adult case. I guess it's Solem, right? And uh, so the, the judiciary has largely refused to, to intervene to deal with this. Uh, in, in, a, in a perfect world, prosecutors would learn to, um, uh, would in some sense feel an obligation to restrain themselves. And when Ed Levy wrote the U.S. Uh, Attorney's Manual, he attempted to do that. How far that's gone? I don't think it's gone very far at all. And to the extent that there are prosecutorial internal guidelines that exist at the state level, you know, I, I, the, the phrase that, that Ron gives is, yeah, you ask him if they're a uh, DA, is there, is there any guidelines? Yeah, there's a, there's a manual someplace, right? And the notion that that constrains them is, 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 not, uh, is not altogether meaningful. So it's a conundrum how to solve this. I would love for the lawmakers, the political branches to solve it. They don't seem willing to do it. And the judiciary um, for kind of a, a Lochnerian hangover seems unwilling to intervene at all. So Maximo, if, if there's so much that we can learn from the European system, why is it uh, that uh, the Europeans seem to be converging towards our system? Uh, so uh, the, uh, I think we, we can learn from any system uh, always uh, uh, in a number of ways. I mean, not, not necessarily learn in the sense that they will have the right solution to, you know, to our problems. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, one, one of the things that characterized very much the comparative criminal procedure literature uh, of 30 years ago, uh, you know, people like Altshuler or like uh, uh, Langbein or, you know, uh, even uh, Schulhofer, you know, I mean, and different people uh, back in the day was this idea of uh, trying to export like whole chunks of, of, uh, of the European system into the US as if uh, this could be feasible uh, these were feasible first, and second, uh, and if this could really be a solution to the problems, I am a skeptic about the the, um, the two things. I think that uh, the, the reason why uh, it's helpful to look at comparative law, at comparative experience, is just because it can give us some perspective on our own system uh, to identify some of the possible problems in our own system, and perhaps some inspiration for some reforms, but, you know, nothing like a cut and paste type of approach, you know, what, what uh, Eric so, uh, uh, said, a uh, call better solutions approach. And I also will be a, a, a skeptic about the possibility of changing things, uh, as Jonathan was saying, and the, the phenomenon of, of, um, a, a, of mass incarceration in America is not that old, you know, it's, 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 it's the last 30 years. Uh, this is actually why I'm, even if I consider, you know, his work excellent, I am a little skeptic actually about Jim Whitman's uh, claim that it's all about dignity because 
hey, you know, if this, if it's that notion of dignity that comes, you know, from from a, 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 the French Revolution or the Enlightenment or you know the American Revolution or whatever, right? I mean, why only the last thirty years? Uh, I do think that when when we are uh, uh, talking about uh, you know improvement uh, in this uh, um, in this area, there are so many different things uh, uh, that that uh, that can be done. Uh, uh, I, you know, in my own analysis in, in the past, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I follow two paths. One would be like to try to go back to kind of bilateral adjudication, uh, meaning a, 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 a plea bargaining and a guilty plea process that in, in some way is more equal, right? Where, you know, where the, the defense position somehow counts. Uh, uh, you know more than it does today, and you know it may be that changes on sentencing. As I don't know if all I fully agree with with Chris uh, uh, support of in, uh, you know of in, uh, regarding some of the penological uh, uh, theories that Chris has defended in the past, very persuasively. But I'm not sure I, I support all, all all his proposals all the way down. But you know, working on sentencing, working on on on. Uh, um, uh, on, on different reforms to reduce overcharging, you know, uh, uh, working on different reforms that in general uh, could uh, diminish the, 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 the potential trial sentences, right, if people don't, don't plead guilty uh, and, and so on. I think actually that in this regard, uh, there are, they are um, reasons for being a, a little more optimistic today in America that you know, in the uh, now than in the previous 30 years. I mean, because for the first time, right, in, in three decades, uh, uh, actually, you know, the levels of incarceration are, are you know either stabilized or going down, right? And, and there is, in general, this is one of the very few issues in which there is consensus on the in the political in the different political sides in the political spectrum, right? That you know. The, we are, we are spending either too, you know there are too many uh, people incarcerated either because it's too expensive or it, because it's the wrong thing to do but there are way too many and so I think that this is actually a good moment to think about reforms that can link uh, either questions of 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 of, uh, of costs or questions about the right thing to do with a specific reforms either to improve to reduce harshness or to improve the plea bargaining process or what prosecutors do in the plea bargaining process. I, it's a little too generic, but I don't want to take a, a more time than this. So it, um, it seems to me that we may be uh, recapitulating here uh, a piece of conventional wisdom that uh, I, I, lots of people seem to keep, atta be, uh, keep attacking. So the conventional wisdom is that there is a convergence between the criminal justice systems of the civil law world and the criminal justice systems of the common law world, and that's a good thing, because we're each learning from each other. Um, the, the civil law world has learned to introduce a little more, el some elements of adversarialism that help them in uh, checking the abuses of a kind of bloated judicial bureaucracy. Um, and they've also introduced, um, in some countries, elements of more democratic accountability, which has also served to reduce some of the excesses of bureaucratic, bloated judicial bureaucracies. So I hear people on this panel saying that maybe we should, we should meet them halfway, that uh, they, they, uh, they haven't introduced as much adversarialism and as much democratic accountability as we have, and that's a good thing. We should maybe temper our democratic accountability and our adversarialism, and then we'll, 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 both systems will be winding up in a better place, and where they'll be winding up is closer to each other. So this is a very conventional thesis. It's a thesis that uh, you talk about in your paper, Eric, and you point out that people have been attacking it, and it, you suggest some sympathy for the view that it's, it's too simple-minded, but it's not sounding that simple-minded sure. to me the more I listen to this discussion. So am I missing something? I think you. I think you've nailed it. Um, I, I, the, the the movement. These kind of Teutonic. It's Teutonic. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, Teutonic. It's also tectonic, Teutonic. Yes, both. Yeah, They're both right. Tectonic and Teutonic. Um, there are there are shifts about now. The, figuring out exactly what is animating those shifts. That's a difficult thing. I do think it has a lot to do with caseloads in 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 Europe. 
and elsewhere. Um, but uh, and 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 there is a sense in which, uh, again, d deferring to a prosecutor in Europe, where the prosecutor it sees him or herself as a judge, that's that that has a different flair to it than um, the notion of deferring to an individual who is assuredly a partisan in the process. Now, uh, you are uh, he, uh, David's absolutely right. You see the movement in Europe. The, 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 there's a movement towards orality, which looks a little bit like our um, uh, um, the requirements for uh, to allow for cross-examination and, and, and the Crawford Doctrine. There is a, uh, a movement um, uh, with regards to very to uh, the exclusion of evidence in certain in certain cases. Um, on our side, um, boy, I don't know where the movement is. Um, I would like to believe that there could be some changes. I. I Again, the, uh, the, 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 the biggest change, I think, would be there's some questions about how you can move the, the soft factors. Um, folks, smart folks like Michael Tonry um, and George Thomas have suggested some ways in which you can uh, try to t uh, tamp down the adversarialness. But again, it seems to me that the real problem is not just that they, are, uh, that they have these uh, immense powers, um, it's what the powers mean. And I, again, I think the Dutch have incredible powers. They're most, the, the most powerful prosecutors around. Uh, it's just that the consequences from their exercising those powers are so far different from uh, a prosecutor who fully exercises their powers uh, in the United States. Um, I think actually uh, we've been talking for a while. And uh, it might be good if uh, we open uh, the floor to questions and comments from some of you. Um, do you want people to speak to the microphone, Sarah? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. I have a big question. Um, so David, first of all, to your point, actually American international law, rather Ameri in international law, America looks to Europe for their precedent. That's actually in the law library. <laughs> So I think it's healthy for all countries to look at different systems. However, because, as was said, America is not a modern state, a rather disenfranchised geography, America looks to other nations to establish a more, a, a more solid foundation for its, its law. Uh, so I have two points I want to make. First of all, a country that wasn't discussed is actually where I grew up and that's Australia, so that's an egalitarian model. And their legal innovate, rather, they have a system of developing people, so they provide a social infrastructure to do that. And part of that is a police force that encourages and teaches or educates its population about civil behavior. Whereas my observation of American police force is very literally they're domestic terrorists. And that's compounded with the FBI and so on. There are many cases if anyone wants to talk to me about that. So I view it more as a national personality. And I think it's wonderful that this is being discussed because I think it's a part of a greater issue for America pertaining to what is the function of a society, such as do we educate people so they have a moral guidance because that doesn't evolve until you're in early adulthood. And secondly, um, I see too many American legal systems that are closed loops of only guilty. And, and that's, you know, we don't need to talk about the issues that are going on. So I think it's more an ecosystem issue about what is the national personality that is expressed through persecution and the, the feeding of cases into that scenario. And so I, am, I have forensic psychology, and one of the biggest issues in American police force is they psychologically fail on accountability. So whether it is a who is being hired, what is being nurtured or protected within that system, and then how does that actually spiral the nation further downwards from an economic undevelopment perspective that has clearly occurred? So I'm going to wrap up that context because I'll ask you a question. Is this more political? Because a lot of the damage has occurred from the Bush administration. 
So is it a political adjustment that needs to be made? Thank you. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I, I look at the political, I, I think it is a political context, but it's, it's unfortunately not something that's gonna be resolved by a shift from one party to the other, uh, uh, because it, it, it's a deeper structure of the state. That said, uh, I, I'm an optimist, and I look at something like Obamacare, which on one hand is exemplary of the kind of incomplete, fragmented state that we tend to do. On the other hand, just opening up the issue of something like a national responsibility of health care is, is a huge advancement in the very idea of, of state responsibility in America. So I actually think we may be at the beginning of an era in which that kind of state building project is going to uh, be accelerated and which may have very beneficial effects. You can already see it here in California where sheriff's offices all over the state are seeking to become Obamacare sign-up points for their inmates, partly to shift these people into a different system where they can be governed more effectively. I, I, just on a kind of a pedantic point, you, you mentioned Australia. Um, it actually builds into what Chris, Chris talked about, that the, the judiciary there has maintained um, uh, a firm hold on their sentencing system and the need for some indeterminacy to make sure that the, the, the punishment fits the crime and the criminal. And so that is an example of, of, a, of a judicial branch in a more, in a more uh, uh, Anglo-based system that nonetheless has, uh, has fought back when there have been legislative attempts to try to, um, uh, to limit uh, judicial discretion at sentencing. And all of these pieces, they all fit if you limit judicial discretion at sentencing, then undoubtedly you are uh, increasing the discretion of the prosecutor. Um, it's like a balloon. You push it in one area, it's going to expand someplace else. And Australia provides a good example of where a uh, the judiciary, in the face of that uh, of attempts to constrain uh, uh, judicial discretion, um, the judges have fought back. Thank you to all the panelists. I had a question for you, Eric. I don't know if your research covered this, but did you see the same phenomenon in um, Europe where you have so many judges who have been prosecutors before that you see in the United States, or are the two systems sufficient, are the tracks sufficiently different so that you end up having them fairly separate? It's a great question. Um, what's interesting uh, in, I'll use Germany as the example, um, you have prosecutors and judges, they cycle. So an individual could be a prosecutor, serve as a judge for a period of time, and then come and be a prosecutor again. And it's consistent with this notion that prosecutors and judges are actually all part of a judicial branch. They don't necessarily see themselves as separate. It doesn't mean that the Europeans don't have a conception of separation of powers. It's just that their own Montesquieu hasn't quite laid down this, these formal divides. And so uh, I actually think that has a leavening effect on it, the fact that you have individuals moving between those positions. If you wanted the ultimate leavening effect, and, and I, uh, uh, you would have individuals, uh, the example, I guess, it's still done in the military. It used to be done in, in England that on any given day, someone would be a prosecutor, and on another day, they'd be a defense attorney. And, and I think that would be a marvelous way to solve it. Now, you, would there be problems? Yeah, there'd be a lot of conflict of interest problems. There are a lot of repeat players in the system. Yeah, and see that have to be bad. It have to be bad people. Um, but I think that would be a marvelous way in which to to uh, we're mentioning um, debiasing to debias um, prosecutors is to be able to see it to be required to see it. Maybe that's something that even law schools could do on a clinical basis is to require those not just to have a prosecutor's uh, clinic and a defense attorney's clinic, but require individuals to do both. So I think those are both interesting ideas. I do think there's some tension. I think there's some tension between thinking, saying that prosecutors should see themselves as kind of the, the fun, you know, uh, should see themselves as uh, just uh, defense attorneys wearing a separate hat that day, on the one hand, and saying prosecutors should see themselves as judges wearing a different hat that day. Um, to, you know, saying that prosecutors should view themselves as part of the same professional group as judges is, is in some tension with the idea that we should view, prosecutors should view themselves as um, just uh, an advocate who happens to be arguing for sure. the government side on a particular day. Sure. I'm not saying that you can't, you can't pursue both, no. but I... Well, and just, my, just, my, just, the, my only, the response to that, David, it's a really good point, is that 
uh, by and large, the notion of switching between defense and prosecution side with continental Europe, that doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense because it's a very weak defense bar. And so uh, and the, whether you're a sitting judge or a standing judge, they, are, they have always had immense powers and still have immense powers. And even the inclusion of new uh, rights that look lot, somewhat like American rights has not resulted in a defense bar that looks anything like uh, that in the United States. So uh, the notion of having individuals switch between prosecution and defense, I think that would be a very Americanized or an Anglo Anglicized <laughs> approach to dealing with this. Whereas if you're dealing with the continental system, you, you, you have a defense bar that is only starting to, to experience any type of authority. How about um, defense attorneys and police officers? Yeah, you, you could do that. Going back to first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, may I say something about this? Just very short. I'm trying to to also su um, uh, support uh, or, or try to put together the two proposals that that uh, on, on their face seem to go in in different directions that that Eric mentioned. I think that wh when when one gets into thinking about the criminal the, the prosecutor as the adjudicator, right, as the facto adjudicator, a challenge for the American system is how to create a, an ethos or, or a perspective in prosecutors that make them more impartial, less, you know, and more empathetic to the other side, right? And, and you know, they are related things. So they are different mechanisms to try to achieve that. And I agree with Eric that, you know, it would be, well, you know, think more of yourself as a judge, right? And of course, there is a whole tradition in American prosecutorial ethics about being uh, prosecutors being officials of justice, where is it that there is more to to that could be done in that tradition, right, or in that direction? The second possibility is, well, you know, why do you do do you put yourself, you know, like, why don't you put yourself in the actual shoes of a defense attorney, you know, uh, every other day, and perhaps, you know, a. a, a Prosecutors as human beings, saying well-intended, well, good people, but you know, with a, 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 you know, a, being brought up and operating within a, a, a particular structure, then perhaps you know would be more empathetic in some situations to the other side or more impartial, right? A, 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 a generally, about the case. Okay. Computers are mainly. Um, you referenced Bill Stuntz's book. I think it's a terrific book. Everybody ought to read it. Um, and he does make this pitch for more democracy, more localism, real localism. That is, juries pick from the venue in which the crime occurs as opposed to some distant location. Um, police officers walking the beat, not in police cars at a distance from the population. Uh, all dispositions taking place in the community. In other words, defendants staying in the community, unless they have to go to prison, but otherwise, the is taking place in the community. Um, 
And it's worth thinking about. Um, I, I, as you can tell from my comments, I'm no leery of democracy as applied to the criminal justice system. The, the fundamental attribution error was mentioned this morning by Professor Sood. And I think when you've got democracy in operation, you've got the fundamental attribution error operating full throttle. Uh, in other words, people just assume, oh, he committed murder, he ought to go be executed, or at least get 50 years. There's no real understanding of the situational aspects of uh, crime, and I'm worried that localism can feed into that. But in rebuttal of what I just said, if juries really were picked from the defendant's venue, they might understand the defendant's venue a lot better. And we might get justice that, that tends to undermine the fundamental attribution error and is much more empathetic to the defendant's background. So I think it's, I think you put it a very nice way, double down on these kinds of things because they are intrinsic to American culture whether we like it or not. Yeah, can I speak to that? Because I, I think that many of those moves would be probably good moves and I would see them as ways to strengthen the democracy of our, you know, the, the, the fundamental democracy, not to reform our criminal justice and to reform our democracy. Let me put in one more plea for dignity here. It seems to me that just fixing democracy will not address the problems that dignity in the contemporary era is, is solving because even small democratic units can become viciously degrading when they have certain motivations to do so. And I, I you know, I, 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 for a long time I disagreed with Whitman that dignity was that important. I kind of drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, um, uh, I can go into the why history has, has changed in ways that make it more important now, but I just, you know, my wife uh, uh, does capital appeals. Let me just give you an example from one of her appeals. Uh, in one of her cases, the prosecutor, you know, turned to the jury and said, this is not a human being, this is an animal. Now, I put it to you that uh, a European lawyer would not say that. Uh, and that simply, you know, you cannot, just changing the democracy of offices, et cetera, is not going to change a mindset in which you can just, that speech act can be made by somebody who thinks of themselves as a professional lawyer, let alone a, a public servant. I, I, that's, a, that's a really good point. And I, not to advocate this, but, uh, and this story may be apocryphal, I think Bob told me this many years. It's not apocryphal. <laughs> but it's got to be true. Apocryphal. <laughs> but as I recall, it, there was a point, maybe it was during the Reagan governor's gubernatorial reign, where they started to fully enforce drug laws. And it started to hit white, affluent kids. And that actually forced some objection, right? And that, that to make, maybe it fits with dignity. We have a real problem with according dignity to the other. And um, if they were forced to, uh, to have that, whatever rule they, they choose, apply to themselves and to their own children, if my kids get the same that your kids get, maybe that could be a turn. Uh, now how that works, whether you, I mean, you can imagine that with the, using Whitman leveling up and leveling down on that. But um, I think that would be a powerful impact um, if whatever, whatever the worst that we were applying to those uh, discrete and insular minorities in the footnote four cents uh, could apply them to the majorities, uh, I think the majorities would think twice about um, the current, way the current system operates. I, I, I like the idea of trying to marshal democracy and, and local democracy in particular to um, Help reform uh, prosecutors' offices. Um, I, um, I you think we should think about that too. By the way, we plug in for David. I, I think we should be thinking about elections in addition to things like juries because, I mean, attorneys for the most part are elected, and for the most part, those elections don't do much to drive district attorneys' offices in ways we would want them to be driven. And I, I think Jonathan is right that part of that is cultural. Um, but part of it may just be that we don't really, we, we don't have mechanisms in place that allow communities to make intelligent decisions about whether to retain a district attorney or not. Um, they, you know, what, if you think back to the last district attorney's race that you watched, how, how do you know whether this is district attorney that should be returned to office or not? It's, we don't, we, and, and we could think, um, I think we should think about ways of um, giving electorates uh, better tools for assessing whether prosecutors are behaving um, in good ways. And it, it's true, though, that, that transparency alone doesn't do that because we need to build in, do something also to, uh, with regard to Ron, making sure that our democratic... Ron Wright mentioned that prosecutors usually don't lose yeah. the re-election yeah. bids, but one famous prosecutor who did lose re-election was up in Brooklyn, yeah. and he was a famous supporter of alternatives to incarceration. Yeah. David? Um, 
I, I wanted to just A nice line of literature out there. On two guarding in the shadows of trial breaking involves a civil literature on bargaining in the shadows. There could be some fairly simple ways that are consistent with our more American traditions that we could tweak things. More discovery, depositions. You have some jurisdictions, Florida, that allows for depositions. Getting rid of. Uh, Things that would open up the process that we could actually have more jury involvement without more trials. And right? We could have more bargaining in the shadow of trials uh, in a way that wouldn't require things somebody was talking about. If we were to actually have more trials, they'd have to be short and truncated and couldn't give you all the process that we want. Well, maybe we could keep our plea bargaining rates somewhat similar, but they could actually be taking place in the shadow of trials. Who could let judges participate in plea bargaining process in a way analogous to the way judges participate in well, civil? Judge Rakoff has, yeah. has recently been. I should say, I should say, because he didn't say that you know the the place to start to think about the relationship between the civil and the and the criminal uh, process would be to read uh, an article that David Sklansky wrote with uh, Steve Yeasel, which is called. You know, comparative law without leaving home. Uh, what civil procedure, what criminal procedure can learn from civil procedure and vice versa, or something like that. So, well, on that positive note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you.